time to review some of those things I think you'll remember from general ecology about ecosystem processes. If we look at the plant community not as what species it's made up of, or even what habitats, but rather how much production comes out of this part of the ecosystem, we can also talk about pools of different elements and nutrients and how those move through the different compartments in the ecosystem. The turnover time, amount of time, the element or whatever spends tied up in that um, component is known as the, is related to the mean residence time. The longer it's in residence, the longer the turnover time. We can do mass balance equations, figuring out how much is put in, how much comes out, and how much is in storage. Oops, misspelled outputs there. In this table of data from Chaparral Scrub, uh, dominated by Ceanothus megacarpa in Southern California, we can see that the, much of the biomass is tied up in, in uh, foliage in the vegetation. And um, nothing seems to be reabsorbed before things fall off. Of course, these are not deciduous plants, I don't think. But anyway, the different columns are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And <clears throat> we can look at how much of each of those is in the vegetation versus how much is in the soil, quite a bit in the vegetation. And then rates of turnover and flux in the bottom part of the table. So the first cycle that's of importance to living systems is the water cycle, which involves liquid water in oceans, lakes, rivers, also solid in the form of ice and snow, being in the ground, underground, in aquifers, an awful lot of water is there. And all of these um, furnish water to the ground, which is taken up through living organisms. Look at what a small proportion um, of water is in living organisms compared to how much is in the global picture. Evaporation takes water up into the sky, into the atmosphere. Of course, water transpiring through plants as well. And forms water vapor in clouds, which eventually, when conditions are right, has precipitation in higher latitudes and elevations. This may come down as snow, but otherwise as rain. And what powers all of this? I want you guys to think about that. It's no mystery, but people may not think of where the energy comes for water to cycle. So every place has a maximum potential evaporation, but then there's the actual evaporation, which depends on what vegetation covers the earth at that point, how dense and shady it is and other factors, and what the energy balance of the ecosystem is. So you can see that even three different, well, different examples of the same kind of forest can have very different rates of evaporation. These three tropical forests versus the temperate grasslands, four different examples there. In this table, we can see how very important forests are to maintaining the watershed because of groundwater recharging under the forest and then taking up a lot of the water again, keeping it in circulation. So ecosystem productivity involves both gross primary production, that, that includes the metabolism of the the producers and net primary production are the new biomass created in the plants. Basically that primary production, net primary production is related to the biomass of the new leaves produced. So here we can look at leaf biomass versus net primary productivity for different kinds of habitats and you can see it's lowest in the desert 
and highest in the coniferous forests. Slightly less in deciduous forests and then in grasslands. Why would that be? And here's a map of productivity over the face of the uh, globe with zero in frozen areas where the glaciers are and highest levels, the dark maroon seen in tropical areas. And the black areas, those that contain mountains where productivity varies with elevation. The units we use to talk about productivity are tons per he hectare, or maybe grams per square meter times 100. Productivity is limited by environmental factors, not only light, but temperature, moisture, and nutrients, all of which affect the rate of photosynthesis in the autotrophic organisms doing the producing. This figure shows that Overall, productivity increases with temperature. And net primary productivity increases with rainfall, with precipitation up to a point, but then as places are too wet, productivity declines. So here's a simple line drawing showing these things that with the age of the stand of the forest productivity increases to a point and then starts to decline. Biomass increases to a point and then levels off at the carrying capacity. And let's see what that leveling off in biomass involves. If we look at each part of the plant's body, the tree's body separately, you can see that the greatest amount of biomass is in the stems or trunks of a tree. Branches, other woody tissues add some. Old leaves that hang on, especially in trees that are not deciduous but evergreen, and current leaves, or maybe we could say new leaves. They're a much lower proportion of the above ground biomass of a tree. So measuring productivity is difficult, but it's kind of important for ecosystem studies. Typical methods involve harvesting and drying and weighing. There are approaches that are biometric, doing a little bit of that and then making a regression to predict uh, how much biomass plants of different heights and widths have. It's very difficult to sample the biomass of a plant below ground because remember, a tree has almost as much underground as above ground, but much of it is fine roots that are hard to harvest. You can, you can use remote sensing techniques for ecosystems you know some pretty well and see, see what different colors indicate. And there are micrometeorological approaches using eddy covariance to look at rates of CO2 flux, etc. But there are always complications in any ecosystem with many species, herbivory and exudates of plants, leaching of nutrients and time lags can all complicate things. So the other side of productivity is decomposition, forming detritus or detritus breaking down into humus, dead parts of plants and animals. These are the decomposition constants and W1 detritus or decomposition at a certain stage is equal to that of the earlier stage time this exponential quantity. Instead of food webs um, where things are eating produ production, we can talk about brown food webs where food of the decomposers. Here's a suitably colored brown dominant diagram showing what happens to litter as it's decomposing to humans, humic acids, etc. So taking that brown food web into account, we can get a handle on net ecosystem productivity looking at net primary productivity minus the decomposition of heterotrophs and maybe 
saying that um, gross primary productivity minus decomposition of autotrophs and heterotrophs can give a good indication of ecosystem productivity. But there are other carbon losses that come from the whole system, methane, leaching, runoff, and volatilization. In this figure, we can see typical gross primary productivity, net ecosystem productivity, and the brown food web represented ecosystem carbon loss through the seasons of the year. In winter, nothing happens. In spring, things are growing. Midsummer, things are at their peak. And then everything declines to nothing again. As an ecosystem ages, gross primary productivity levels off. Net primary productivity reaches a peak, then declines. But you can see that the decomposition is steadily increasing. So why is this stuff important? Dominant fluxes in the global carbon cycle affect the future of our planet and our, all of our lives as well. So let's take a look at this carbon cycle. Carbon is fixed in plants in photosynthesis, but here we see lots of other major exchanges of the earth with the atmosphere when trees are removed from the landscape a great amount of carbon goes back into the atmosphere. Fossil fuels being burned send a lot of carbons in. And the total bound up in terrestrial ecosystems is much less than that that is in the oceans. So this shows the importance of what is called blue carbon now. And of course, tons and tons stored in the carbonate rocks. Probably the most complicated of the cycles is the nitrogen cycle because there are many intermediate steps, most of which are performed by different kinds of bacteria. There's nitrogen fixation, both free living and by those uh, bacteria that live in root nodules of certain plants. Lightning fixes nitrogen, and of course there are industrial processes that do it as well. Mineralization takes place in the soil, ammonification and nitrification. Denitrification, leaching, passive, and as well as things that immobilize nitrogen, sometimes binding it up in living tissues, other times just holding it. This beautiful diagram shows a lot of these different steps, not too complicated, but you can see all the different arrows going back and forth. It is a pretty complicated system, uh, cycle, I should say. Plants taking up nitrogen in the form of nitrates and then decomposing, losing it, dead bodies going back into the organic matter of the soil where there's mineralization, ammonification, nitrification, etc. Nitrates lead to groundwater is pollution and sometimes can cause overgrowth of vegetation, other things that are harmful to the environment. And in the marine system, much is leached and run off and then fixed by photosynthetic autotrophic organisms in the water and cycled around. And then the abiotic things, like lightning causing nitrogen fixation, a pretty cool phenomenon. So this list sums up what I just said. And here's a more in the soil diagram of what's happening with non-living organic Nitrogen in the soil being used in different ways by bacteria to make nitrates, nitrites, nitrites taken up by plants. And of course, even though 70 plus percent of the atmosphere is nitrogen, this is unavailable to living things until it's fixed.
Phosphorus is really important to plant growth, so plants use it and recycle it. Phosphorus is unusual that it's not present as a gas, but rather as dust, and so its cycling cycle looks much simpler when we diagram it. A good source of phosphorus, too, is the guano or excreta of birds and other uh, animals, bats. So we can see that mining is a source of phosphorus, and of course a lot moves in the air as dust, not a lot, some. But basically plants and decomposition are very important in this cycle. And of course a lot of phosphorus is stored in unweathered rock, which as it weathers releases it to the surroundings. Phosphorus leaching to groundwater can be a big problem with polluting environments and cattails, as you all know, are a native part of our flora here, but their presence in certain habitats that are low nutrient, oligotrophic, indicates nutrient pollution, often phosphorus. So the calcium cycle is another cycle important to plants and again like um, phosphorus doesn't cycle as a gas, in plants it doesn't move that much through the system but falls off and decomposes and comes back into, this, into circulation. Other important elements are sulfur and potassium. Sulfur especially interacts with the water cycle to form clouds and there's a lot of sulfate in oceans. We can often detect the presence of sulfur with our noses.